Welcome back. We're talking to the man whose job was to be the TARP watchdog, protect against fraud, hold banks accountable. Here's one criminal case where he was successful in getting it pursued. Take a look. The charges that have been filed against Lee Bentley Farkas, he is the former chairman of TBW, a private mortgage lender. Um, regulators are charging him with fraud in about a $1.9 billion scheme that eventually led to the downfall of Colonial Bank um, Corp. But he describes in his book how even though he had built or agents had built an airtight case, DOJ was pushing back. They didn't want to pursue it. And they continued to. He says the DOJ pr prosecutors continued to push back hard. Their timidity was frustrating. I think that they just didn't have the confidence that comes from prosecuting a series of complex, high-profile cases. And Mr. Borowski, who had been a prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, a, a very well-known district, obviously, said his prosecutor friends from that district, it was called the office, were shocked that the DOJ was, was not wanting to pursue this. And so I have some questions about what this means for our expectations of the DOJ. Let's bring back in Neil Borofsky. And, and Mr. Borofsky, is this wimpy DOJ that you paint in your book, the DOJ that we've been relying on to investigate, prosecute, and charge higher profile Wall Street executives at too big to fail firms for crimes in connection with the financial crisis? You know, I, not just in that case, but in a number of cases, I saw a real lack of sophistication uh, in a lot of the prosecutors' offices around the country when it came to complex accounting fraud cases. And you know, those cases are different from other types of white collar cases. They they require a level of expertise and experience. And you know, part of what I saw as a prosecutor was there was a huge shift in white collar law enforcement resources, particularly the FBI, after 9/11 away from some complex accounting frauds over to counterterrorism investigations. Hmm. And I, I think that has created something of an experience gap, which I saw, unfortunately, uh, time and time again. And I think it does impact why we've seen fewer cases. Well, you just touched on something that, that reminds me of something in your book, where you said that you got so sick of hearing in Washington the argument about reputational risk, that banks will do the right thing because of their reputational risk. Similarly, what I've gotten sick of hearing, and, and we have, is this um, excuse for not prosecuting high-level officials on Wall Street when there is ample evidence that there could be cases. I'm not a lawyer, of course, but, but from a lot of people that I've talked to. Uh, and one thing that we always hear is these cases are too tough. And you're, you're talking about the sophisticated experience that it requires, but you did this. You you did this with REFCO. You, you put away the president and the CEO. That's a firm that I'm sure a lot of our viewers probably did business with and know very well, or knew it back then, I should say, because it's defunct. Who, Neil Borofsky, you were a prosecutor, who could you build a criminal case for in terms of crimes at major firms, too big to fail firms? We've heard a litany of examples where there could be the Goldman Sachs abacus deal, Timberwolf, uh, Lehman, where they were uh, evidently using, uh, what was it, Repo 105 to book billions of dollars in phony sales, according to an independent examiner that found actionable claims against them. We have the LIBOR scandal. We have John Corzine, which is, of course, MF Global, but, I mean, he, he was a Goldman Sachs CEO, and, and it has kind of been a, a fallout, I guess you could say, in the years after the financial crisis. Who could you build a case against? You know, I think the LIBOR investigation is the most recent and uh, unfortunately, I think given how much time has elapsed since the, since the actions of the financial crisis, perhaps DOJ's best opportunity to start putting people in handcuffs. I mean, this has been, this is, the facts that we already know are some of the most you know, blatant attempts to manipulate one of the world's most important interest rates in the, in the world. Um, and the conduct seems pretty clear, and it seems like it does lead its way up the ladder. So I certainly hope to see some movement in those cases. Uh, but it's also hard to get too excited uh, and too optimistic given the performance we've seen to date. Do you think as a prosecutor that there could be criminal charges related to LIBOR manipulation that you could build for CEOs of firms that were found to have traders manipulating it? You know, that's a real question of, of how they approach these cases. Um, you know, the conduct so far, we haven't seen that type of direct evidence that would give you the confidence to bring a charge that you could prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, but there certainly are suggestions that it might be there. Um, and of course, what they need to do, though, is you need to start charging people. You need to start putting people in cuffs and pressuring them to flip up to their bosses. Um, that's how you get the big fish at these companies. You have to start somewhere. Um, and hopefully, we'll see that soon. Uh, you know, start with the mid-level executives and work your way up the ladder and find out if this is something that was
was being known about and approved at the highest of levels. And that really goes to so many of these cases, whether it's robo-signing we saw in the aftermath of the crisis as well. Um, you've got to start somewhere, and we haven't seen that action yet, even though years and years have gone by. Why do you think we don't see wiretapping and the kind of um, methods that I always hear guys using from, from your old stomping grounds at, at the office? I think wiretapping would be difficult right now because you have to be ongoing cases, mm. and we're, these are historical transactions, and it does appear. Although I think the LIBOR is actually, a, it, you actually raise a really good point, because apparently the New York Fed was on full notice by April 2008 that this was going on. Barclays had essentially confessed they were doing so um, and did nothing with that information, didn't alert Department of Justice. And we know that, that, that behavior continued on for another year. Yeah. So that actually would have been a really great opportunity. But of course, the New York Fed just sat on the information and didn't share it, we uh, which is part of the problem. It's mm -hmm. one of the problems I talk about in the book is just how captured these regulatory institutions have become mm -hmm. to the interests of Wall Street, where they're too busy enabling fraud that rather than referring and getting it prosecuted. And what do you think is the antidote to that? Because regulatory capture comes up a lot in your book, as you said. You have a, a tale from Neil Kashkari where he's saying, hey, they're afraid of Neil, you, Neil Borofsky, because they're used to going and having beers with their regulators, and, and you don't play that game. What is the antidote to that and the revolving door, which you talk a lot about? It's two things we need to do. One, we got to get rid of that corrupting influence that comes from these banks, these mega banks that are too big to fail by breaking them up. And then second, we have to re- imagine our regulatory system. Right now, the, the incentives for so many regulators are not to do their jobs to protect the American people, but to go along and get along. I talk about in the book how one very senior Treasury official took me aside in 2010 and told me point blank that because my tone, my harsh tone and my criticisms of Wall Street and of Washington, um, that I was doing a real disservice and harm to my family and my ability to earn a living in the future, but that if I changed my tone and became more positive and upbeat, well, then great things could happen to me, a job at Wall Street or maybe even a judgeship from the Obama administration. And, and that captures the problems that face so many of our regulators. The economic incentives, the individual incentives, because it's all about individual incentives, mm -hmm. are often not to push back um, and not to, to be aggressive, um, but instead to get in line and hope for the future payout. Yeah, and you know, one of the things uh, that you talk about, and, you, and, you, and you, you lay out a lot of good points, uh, Timothy Geithner, you are not a fan of, to say the least, at least not judging by your book. But here he is responding to your criticism that he was too friendly to the banks, because it gets to this issue of the revolving door. He says, that doesn't apply to him. Take a listen. I'm deeply bed. offended by that. I find that deeply offensive. It, you know, it's the result of an urban myth, uh, significantly. A lot of people thought and wrote in publications of record that I spent my life at, at Goldman Sachs rather than as a public servant. He says, that's not true. I was in public service. There's no revolving door here. Nothing to see. How do you respond to that argument? Because it's actually one that Jackie Combs made in her New York Times piece, which some said was essentially a hit piece of you. But how do you react to that? And I don't want to sound like a Timothy Geithner apologist. I just want to ask. <laughs> No, 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 absolutely. And having read the book, you know that this is all part of the playbook. I mean, every one of the things that you said, in some ways I should have subtitled my book, A User's Guide on How to Know How Washington is Deceiving You, because <laughs> this is right out of what they've always done. The first, you start with the fake outrage, and it's sort of a running gag in the book how Treasury officials are always deeply or personally offended whenever somebody suggests that they did something untoward. Then it's erecting a straw man here. It's this, he's really suggesting that I said that he worked at, at, at Goldman Sachs, right. which is something I never did. And in Right. In fact, I actually remember correcting a congressman once who suggested that. Um, and look, you know, regulatory capture does, does, just doesn't come from having worked in Wall Street. You look at the people that Tim Geithner surrounded himself at the New York Fed and when he got to the Treasury Department, all of them had that, that ideology and those interests. And when you scream into that echo chamber, um, that's what you hear back. And I think for Geithner, what, was, what really came alive to me is when I had a confrontation with him in 2009, and much like the bankers themselves and all the bankers who worked at Treasury, he wouldn't listen to any discussion. Uh, there we were talking about having the banks um, report on how they were using TARP funds. You know, all he could do was repeat the talking points that, that I heard so many times from the financial institutions themselves about how it wouldn't be possible. And it's this sense that if you haven't worked at a bank, you really aren't worthwhile of having an opinion, um, that you're stupid, as I was told, that you're political, mm -hmm. that you have ulterior motives. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's all part of it. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of politics, I do want to ask, because one of the expe expectations you had in your story, in your book, was that things would get better once the Bush administration left, that they had to be better under the Obama administration. But then the administration comes in, and you found that was not the case. Look into 2012. 
Now that we know Paul Ryan has been chosen for Mitt Romney's running mate, do you think there would be any material difference in the way Wall Street is treated and the financial system is handled in an Obama administration next time around or a Romney administration? And I should warn our viewers with a spoiler alert, you are a Democrat from what I understand. Yes, no, I've been a lifelong Democrat. I contributed to Obama's campaign in 2008. And, and look, on this core issue of the enablement of the too big to fail institutions, there's almost no gap between the two administrations. Nobody's coming out and, and advocating for what we need to do, which is to break up the banks uh, and break their stranglehold on our economy and on our government. Now, look, I mean, it seems like the Romney-Ryan team wants to go back to 2008 and even the modest reforms that we had in Dodd-Frank in 2010 and get rid of them and not replace them with anything, which would be even worse than what we have. But the difference between even worse and what we have you know, isn't all that material from the idea of are we on the path towards another financial crisis and have we addressed the real problems that led to the crisis in 2008? And the answer there is no. So I would say between the two of them, that there's unfortunately not a lot of light between their positions when it comes down to that very, very core issue of what are we going to do about too big to fail banks? Oh, I had, a, I had a feeling you were going to say that. I was hoping it could be different. But uh, anyway, really quick before we go, I just have a minute. I just have to ask, because Ben Lofsky, who's the regulator we keep hearing about now, he's a buddy of yours from the office. You said so in your book. I know that you said that you think federal regulators are going after him for doing his job and making them look stupid. But do you think we could see more of this coming out of the New York prosecutor's office, going after banks and executives at big banks over high-profile crimes, despite whatever the federal regulators are doing? What do you think? Prediction. Look, I think I think Ben Lawsky has put down a marker, and you know, again, they have a limited ability as New York State Banking Authority. They don't have criminal jurisdiction, um, but I think he's going to get tough and do what he what he can from his very limited perch. Uh, outside of that, unfortunately, haven't seen much movement. And that is a depressing reality, but one that is so important to keep talking about with people who understand it and know like you. So thank you so much, Neil Borofsky. It is a pleasure. I could have asked you a million more questions. Instead, I'll just, uh, I don't know, reread your book. Thanks. He's author and special, former and special inspector general for TARP.